Hello, everyone. Remember the last devotional that I did? I talked about out of the book of John, God sent Jesus, God gave Jesus. It was his destiny, and that's what we talked about. But do you know that in doing that, we have, if we go all the way back into the Old Testament, we have the Psalm of David that says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, and forget not all his benefits. Those benefits come from that destiny of Jesus. Even though it comes all the way back from the Old Testament, when we read the Old Testament, we think about the new and Jesus coming because the benefits are from the coming of that Christ, of that Jesus, of that man to come so that we might have salvation and be saved and have everlasting life. So bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his angry forever. If we move on, we can see like a father pitieth his children. So the Lord pitieth them that fear him. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children. Jesus came for all these benefits. Bless the Lord, ye his angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearken unto the voice of the Lord. Bless ye the Lord, all ye his hosts, ye ministers of his, that do his good pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. What a wonderful psalm, the psalm of David. Well, Doug, it's so good to be back. I, I get more excited every time I do one of these things for the television program. I, I just love it. Well, you're the ones getting all the fan mail. <laughs> I love that, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are plugging along. Uh, in January began our 35th year of doing this, and uh, God has just opened up the opportunity to travel the world and just teach about prayer. And uh, somebody said to me in a seminar uh, many years ago, said, I came to hear the man teach who, who could teach more than one hour in prayer. Cause what else there to know about prayer? It's just telling God what he ought to do. And <laughs> that's it. But I tell you, there's much, much more to learn. And Amen I think to that. That's <laughs> part of our problem is that we have such a underdeveloped, a theology of prayer, we don't really, we don't really understand it. So this has been our mission: twenty books, schools of prayer, 
uh, 50,000 people or so through uh, one of our schools of prayer. One of our schools of prayer probably attracted that many um, over the years that we have, uh, that we've done this every um, uh, Wednesday night, we do a school of prayer. And uh, this Wednesday night, <clears throat> he has been doing transforming your personal prayer life. And I'm telling you, if you're missing this, this is something that will really enhance your prayer life. It will help you to know better who and what you are along the lines of prayer. And it will develop into something that you don't even realize. Based on Paul's uh, concise theology of prayer. And, um, and that's out of Timothy chapter 2, where Paul says, now, first of all, the first thing you got to set in order is you, not, you don't rent the building or hire the band or buy the sermon book. The first thing you set in order is you set your prayer piece in order and, uh, and, and you embrace petition or supplication, worship, prosuke, only use of approaching God in reverence, uh, Antusis, intercession, prayer for others, and then of course, and then of course, Eucharistia, giving uh, giving thanks to uh, to God. And then he said, "Focus that on kings." We don't do that. And those in authority, literally people with influence, all men that we might live peaceable lives, and that men might be that men might be uh, saved. Every Sunday morning, I'm opening my Bible wherever I am, and I'm doing a thing called Sunday morning manna. And this is how you pray the Bible for about 30 minutes. Every Saturday night, we are doing a national prayer call. And you can join us on that, uh, on that uh, prayer call. And somewhere in that hour, you'll hear my voice uh, calling for, uh, for, for prayer. So what did I miss? Uh, the Wednesday morning at 6.30, uh, those are intercessors that pray for us. And I think that's important to acknowledge that they have prayed for us for many, many, many years. And so if there's an intercessor out there that wants to join the 630 prayer time, uh, that would be something that we yeah. might need to add to our list. Yeah. Yeah. It's a small <laughs> intimate group that just meets and hears our concerns and, uh, and prays for us because we need, uh, we need prayer support. Uh, we need prayer support as uh as well. And don't forget, this is the uh, 13th month of the year. It's often called. It's that <laughs> month in which ministries like ours try to catch up. And uh, we invested so heavily in the Korean prayer project, also in prayer at the heart, uh, in pushing that movement, that national movement to the state level. Now we have a separate 501c3 for that and uh, a separate executive director for uh, for that for that we're really really grateful but we're still involved in, uh, in 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 that effort and America's prayer meeting movement encouraging open public prayer meetings to pray for the nation Christians gathered across denominational lines in yes. various uh, in various cities so don't forget to uh, 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 an end of the year gift would be such a uh, such a blessing uh, uh, to us. And we also have uh, for the rest of the year and into January, uh, if you order uh, books uh, from us, from our um, online bookstore, live publications, uh, if you order books from us, we'll give you a, a, a gift. It's not a very expensive gift. It's a wonderful little gift called Acres of Diamonds. And here's a promotion on that little on that little book. The little book is called Acres of Diamonds. It's by Russell Conwell. I've kept a copy of this in my library for, well, 50 years. It's an extraordinary little book. I want to give it to you with any order to a live publications between the time you hear this broadcast and the end of January 2023. My gift to you. Let me tell you why I like this little book. It's about, it's about a treasure that you can't always see. I feel like going back to this picture I keep on my uh, table here in my office. This is actually me. I'm the little kid with a bent over head at the 
into this ragtag group of uh, kids. And that's my mother standing right behind me. It's a cinder block church. In fact, the church is not even finished on top of this little building in this little musty space where I went to Sunday school and the church above it. Those were formative years for me. I would have never guessed in those growing up years that God would have allowed me to travel the world, all the continents, touching down and ministering in times in national meetings, a couple times in continental meetings that brought together 40, 50 leaders of nations where I had the glorious privilege of sharing with them. In fact, in fact, I got expelled from Sunday school. I remember one pastor who told me, he said, I would never have expected that you would have turned out to be a preacher, a pastor. I thought you would be a bootlegger or a bank robber. Let me tell you something. There may have been people in your past that didn't understand what God wanted to do with you. You may have been expelled from Sunday school or something or something else, but God saw in you something worth redeeming and he sent his son to find you. That's really the story of Acres of Diamonds. There's a wonderful little story, well terrible in one sense, about a man who heard about the gold strike in California and he sold his farm and headed to find gold. The man, the man who bought his farm, Colonel Sutton, well, he took out $38 million of gold from the property that the man had sold looking for gold. Let me tell you something. The Bible says that you are a treasure, a precious treasure that Christ has redeemed. Acres of diamonds, my gift to you for any order that you send to Alive Publications between now and the end of January 2023. So we're going to uh, go into this uh, program now that is going to be the Koreans. They were so impactful for us, for so many uh, different states, so many cities, that uh, we are so grateful for them coming. Uh, we can't even begin to say thank you or even how grateful we are for what they did. And, and coming at their own expense, it, it's just, it's unimaginable. I'm thinking about my own. Uh, if I was to go to another nation, that would just be so difficult for me to pay my own way to go there to pray for them. But they did it. They love us. They love America. So we are um, really in a fight for the nation. I think uh, this program, I have a heavier heart than I have maybe on any program that we've done in all the time that we've been doing. Uh, um, we started doing our program uh, about a year and a half ago, and then we um, switched to this hour, hour format. Um, I wrote a book um, a couple years ago and released it uh, called uh, The New Apostolic Epic. And I think I have a copy of it here if I could get it. And the book really doesn't go into what I'm about to share with you. It's got the determination of a praying missional people. And my thesis here is that, is that we are in an epical season yes. in which God is himself uh, manipulating the affairs of man. He is inserting himself into history. By apostolic, I don't mean apostles. I mean the sovereign governance of of. Uh, of God. Every 500 years, you get this mega shift. I wasn't even aware that other people were writing about this until afterwards. Somebody pointed out and asked me if I'd read a certain person's uh, uh, a book. Uh, 500 years ago, we had the Reformation of the Church. 500 years before that, we had the Crusades and the Great Split 
of the church east and west. 500 years before that, you have the collapse of the Roman Empire and the rise of the Holy Roman uh, mm -hmm. Empire. You have the declaration of, of Constantine that makes uh, Christianity legal so it comes out of hiding. 500 years before that or, or so, you have uh, the birth of Christ, the ministry of Christ, his death, burial, resurrection, his ascension, and the birth of the apostolic church, and subsequently the destruction of the second temple and Jerusalem. 500 years before that, you have the Babylonian incursion, invasion into Judah, the death of Judah as a nation, the destruction of Solomon's temple, the 70 years of captivity, and, and subsequently the return of the Jews. 500 years before that, you, you have... Uh, you have uh, uh, David. Every 500 years, now you can measure and say there are significant events that happen every 100 years or so. But if you just go back and look, as I just did, at the calendar, for every 500 years, you get these seismic shifts. But I want to point out that these are not simply things that happen in the spiritual dimension. These are things that are happening geopolitically. These are things that are happening economically. Uh, during the time of David's ascendancy to the throne, when he had put down all the enemies and was taking tribute from all the nations around him and into the reign of Solomon, there is no more dominant kingdom on the earth than the kingdom of Israel, uh, led by David and subsequently by uh, Solomon. And then you have the division, north and south, of that uh, of that kingdom. In the time of the Babylonian captivity, you have the collapse of Assyria, the rise of Babylon, and then you have the shift in the 70-year period, uh, geopolitically, the rise of the Persians and favor again of Israel that allows them to come, come back. You get these geopolitical shifts at the same time that you get spiritual, at the same time that you get these uh, incredible spiritual shifts that are taking uh, that are taking place. In the Reformation 500 years ago, it wasn't just Luther nailing 500 or 95 theses to the church door 500 years ago. It's more than that. It was a shift from papal authority across all of Europe and, 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 and uh, much of the world to national, the birth of the national churches in, 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 in Switzerland and in and in Germany and in England and, 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 and so forth. So what I'm saying to you today, when I talk about the apostolic epoch that we're in, I'm not just simply talking about something that's happening in the church or something that's happening in the spiritual dimension. We are in a period of extraordinary geopolitical change. We've reigned as America, our dollar has reigned since World War II. The entire world uh, adopted the dollar, which was as good as gold, as their currency. And we have been in an extraordinary, enviable position for all these years. And then because of uh, the Vietnam War and, and because of the Great Society programs, we began to spend more money than we were taking in. And the world noticed it. And since our money was as good as gold, the world wanted gold. They began to ask for the privilege of trading their dollars in and getting gold. If we were to have acquiesced to that response, the gold would have flowed out of America. So President Nixon did an interesting thing. He took us off the gold standard. In that same period, Saudi Arabia and the Arab nations were persuaded to sell their oil in dollars. So if the dollar wasn't as good as gold, it was as good as energy. It was as good as oil. And that enriched the Arab, the Arab nations. But it also sent us on a spiral of printing money, of inflation, of balancing our own budget by inflation, which meant the rest of the world Mm -hmm. was paying for our uh, standard of our standard of living. And here, here's where we are now. In the last few weeks, China and Russia have come together to announce 
to announce a new economy that they are uh, that they are creating. And if they do that, if they're successful in doing this, they will dethrone the dollar as the dominant global reserve uh, currency. Because you see a, a fiat money system that is uh, makes the dollar as good as we say it is won't last very long. It has to be backed up by something, by something real, by something, by something uh, a, a tangible. And so we are in trouble as a a, a nation. If you're born in, in, into this nation, you're born with seventy two thousand dollars worth of debt. You're in. You're in poverty the moment that you are born. Right now, our national debt, debt America, is $31 trillion, uh, $31 trillion. The global debt is $70 trillion. All the nations that are in debt together. But we own almost half of the global debt. And we, again, are asking the nations to absorb that debt by our inflation. And they are beginning to to say no to that. Our inflation rate is 7.7. Canada's is about 8.1. And incrementally, incrementally, we are all losing value, all uh, slipping backwards in terms of the power of purchasing power of our, uh, of our dollar. So this Russia, Sino currency, Russia, Russia, you see, we squeeze Russia out in the Ukraine, in the Ukraine war, and we forced them off the dollar. And so what Russia did was they opened, they opened a bank in Beijing and began talks with the Chinese about the possibility of building their own sphere of global influence and, and creating a unit of currency for that sphere of influence. So Beijing, in July this year, bought 80 tons of gold, $4.6 billion worth of gold. And in June, they had bought 32 tons of gold. They are seventh in the world in terms of gold of gold uh, stores. And it looks like India and Brazil and South Africa will join this new currency Alignment. Indonesia is talking about the possibility of joining this alliance as as well. What's the point? No, the 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 point is, the point is that this tectonic shift that I'm talking about is not just a shift in terms of the church or the style of the church or what God is calling us to do. It's a shift in terms of power, the ascendancy of global communism, the ascendancy of China. As the dominant, as the dominant world power, this is this is shivering, and and this is why our Korean friends are worried because just across their border is North Korea, and just across their border is China, and just across that border is Russia, and they realize if America goes away, then this world becomes a very dark place. We're not just talking about a little revival of better gospel singing in the church. We are talking about the need for a profound spiritual reset in the church, the very purpose of the church, the very purpose of our lives as believers, the, the levels of consecration that we have. Let, let, me, let, me, let me encourage you because I know that's, that's a whole load to have dumped on, on you. It, it, was, it was in World War II when Churchill went before the English people, and he said, we have before us an ordeal of the most grievous kind, and we can echo what Churchill said. We have many, many long months of struggle and suffering. You ask, what is our policy? I say that our policy is that we will wage war by by sea and by land and by air and with all our might and with all the strength that God can give us. We will wage war against a monstrous tyranny never never surpassed in the dark, a lamentable catalog of human crime. What is our aim? 
Churchill asked his people victory, victory at all costs, victory in spite of all terror, victory however long and however hard the road may be. And, and, and let, me just, let me just go on to this because, because Churchill would say that, that many old and famous states have fallen and, 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 and they will fall in the grip of the Gestapo but we will not flag or fail. We will go on to the end. We will fight, and this is his great speech, in France. We will fight on the seas and oceans. We will fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We will defend our island, whatever the cost may be. And this great line, we'll fight on the beaches and we'll fight on the landing grounds and we'll fight in the fields and we'll fight in the streets and we'll fight on the hills. We will never surrender. And even if, if, and I do not believe this for a moment, this island or a large part of it were subjugated and starving, then our empire, our empire beyond the seas, armed and guarded by the British fleet, would carry on the struggle until in God's good time, the new world with all its power and might would step forth to rescue and liberate the old world. What an incredible speech when he stepped off the stage after giving this speech, this bullion speech full of faith and bluster. It was a declaration of faith. He said, he said to a colleague, the truth is, we'll have to fight them with the butt ends of broken bottles because that's bloody all that we have. He knew, he knew that barring a miracle, they didn't have a chance. And barring a great awakening, we don't have a chance. We don't have a chance. Only God can turn this around. Only God. You, you, you. Somebody said that. Somebody said the speech of Churchill was worth a, a, a thousand guns and a and the speeches of a, th of a thousand years. But only because it rallied the spirit and confidence of the English people. And that's really what I'm trying to say to you: is that God is wanting us to rally as we face the new year in a way that we may have never done before. Let me tell you two stories. Westminster Abbey was built on the site of an ancient uh, uh, cultic uh, 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 church. It was dedicated in, in 1060, uh, 65. It was destroyed and then it was rebuilt. Uh, the home of 600 royal tombs, 16 royal weddings have taken place, 36 royal uh, coronations have, uh, have taken place there. And on the night World War I, September 24th, a bomb dropped, but it failed to explode. It was as if God was protecting it. And all through World War II, after the bombs had fallen, after the blitz had come, people would go outside and look to see if the spire of Westminster or St. Paul's, the two great churches, were still, were still standing. At one time, a crater 10 feet across broke into the, into the garden. At another time, the there were there were spots of fire on the roof of 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 both St. Paul's and Westminster Abbey. But the fact that the churches stood and they were constantly, constantly the site of the German bombers because they knew if they could destroy those churches, they could destroy the spirit of the people. But they kept, but they kept, but they kept missing. In World War II, on one occasion. An extraordinarily massive bomb. It would have not only destroyed St. Paul's, it would have destroyed the entire area around it. It, it. it hit next to the church and started digging itself under the foundation. And for hours they dug and, and worked and worked and dug until finally one worker down in the hole said, I've got, I've got it. I've got it by the nose. And they put a they put a cradle on it, a harness on it, and they and they gently pulled out this live bomb, these men working around it to save that cathedral. One of the guys said, I've never been here before. Isn't there a registry that I can sign? And so before they hauled this live bomb out of London to detonate it, this kid had to sign the, had to sign the registry. He wanted his name 
on the record at St. Paul's that he had been there on that particular night. Let me tell you, the enemy is doing everything he can yes. to bomb the church, to destroy the church. Mm -hmm. But the church, the church triumphant, it's the Lord's church. He, he builds it. It, it. it can't be destroyed. It won't be destroyed. After all that Russia did, after all that China has done, the underground church in China is stronger today than it has ever been before. Maybe we need a little pressure. Maybe we need a little something to drive us to our knees. Maybe, maybe we need an economic reset around the world that just reminds us of how good we had it all these years and how ungrateful to God we have uh, we've been. Well, that, that's, that's pretty depressing, too. In the middle of World War II, here you have Churchill's speech. You have Westminster and St. Paul's that refused to fall despite the bombs falling around them. And you had the voice of Vera Lynn. Barbara, I love her songs. I know. <laughs> I love her songs. You play them all the time. I do. I play them all the time. <laughs> we'll meet again. Don't know where, don't know when. But I know we'll meet again some sunny day. Keep smiling through just like you always do till the blue uh, skies chase the dark clouds all, all the way. And will you please say hello to the folks that I know, tell them I won't be long as the troops go off to war in World War II. Uh, they'll be happy to know that as you saw me go, I was, I was singing this song. We go into the battle. We go into the battle singing. And the other song that she sang was, sang was there'll be blue birds over the white cliffs of Dover. And that's where the German warplanes came. There'll be blue birds over the way. There were no blue birds over. In fact, there are no blue birds, they say, at the White Cliffs of Dover. But what a metaphor. Blue birds over the White Cliffs of Dover tomorrow. Just you wait and see. There'll be love and laughter and peace ever after tomorrow when the world is free. The shepherd will tend his sheep. The valley will bloom again. And Jimmy, who's afraid to sleep by himself because of the bomb's falling, he will go to sleep in his own little room again. I tell you, there'll be bluebirds over the white cliffs of Dover tomorrow. Just you wait and see. Even the tribulation lasts only three and a half years at its worst, seven at its full. It'll be over, and when it's over, Christ will return. One more song that Vera Lynn sang. It was an anthem. It was a wonderful, we don't sing anthems anymore. She sang, there'll always be in England <laughs> while there's a country lane, wherever there's a cottage small beside a field of grain. I give you a toast, ladies and gentlemen. I give you a toast. May this fair land we love so well in dignity and freedom dwell. There'll always be an England and England shall be free. If England means as much to you as England to means me. to me. In the final analysis, we want to see a revival that <clears throat> turns America back to God. We want to see a revival that resets the moral thermostat. We want to see a revival that sweeps 10 to 20 percent of the population into the kingdom of God. We want to see a revival that fills up the churches again and and starts as yes, many more as there are. We want to see a revival that captures oh, the yes. hearts of young people and breaks our addiction to drugs. We want yes. to see a revival that brings back the family, the nuclear family. But 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 if 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 that revival doesn't come, I warn you that we can't marry the revival and nationalism too tightly. That if the revival comes and revives the nation, we rejoice. But if the revival comes and produces an underground church in America, we'll still, we'll still, we'll still rejoice. We are at a point of crisis. And let me tell you, folks, this is really what we're all about. Yes. It, it, it's about what do we do on one hand to create prayer resources to help the church become a house of prayer for the nations? Yes. And what do we do on the other hand to spark and encourage a great spiritual awakening. That's one and that's two and that's one and that's true. And that's that's really who Project Pray, that's really who Project Pray is. Uh, is and so all that's about. why you do the schools of prayer, is for mobilization, mobilization and training to help 
bring about this uh, revival and the Great Awakening and uh, to enhance what some people already know, but some don't know. And so through the schools of prayer, like we have uh, our transforming your personal prayer life into um, this is one of the things that you do every Wednesday night at six o'clock. I know it's church night, but you can you don't have to watch it at six o'clock. It's also on the YouTube channel. And we and we did it at six o'clock, hoping that um, that could become a pre-service for some Wednesday night uh, services. They could have a class at six o'clock, facilitated by somebody, and then go into the uh, go into the uh, go into the sanctuary. Yes, but and, and that's of course why we do the books and why we create the resources and the teaching kits and and uh, why we're trying to build this Project Pray University, which will be the most robust collection of prayer resources and prayer training anywhere, anywhere in the world. Well, we're running a little behind. I waxed too eloquent there. <laughs> let, let me let's show you one video from where the Koreans were last year in Bellingham, Washington, and this is a, a report of what that of what that team, that team spent five days there praying uh, right near the Canadian border in Washington state. Every Wednesday night at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I'm standing right here or behind this podium, and I'm using my trusty PowerPoint slides, and I'm teaching a school of prayer. You can enroll in these schools of prayer. You can tune in. We throw them out on social media, Facebook, Project Pray. 
You can pick them up on the Project Pray YouTube channel, the Project Pray channel. Make sure and subscribe. Make sure and like this on social media, and you'll know when we're going live to do these things. We've gone through simple, radical prayer. We've talked through the book, The Prayer Closet, how to establish your own personal prayer room. We've gone through transforming your personal prayer life, deep, in-depth study on Paul's concise theology of prayer with more than 50 personal prayer exercises because you don't learn it unless you do it. Every Wednesday, 6 p.m. Now you can pick this up later if that's inconvenient. Eastern Time, the Project Pray Weekly School of Prayer. Join me. The number is 518-318-7117. 518-318-7117. No code. And every Saturday night, sometimes hundreds and all the time dozens join together to pray for spiritual awakening in this nation. It's not a prayer request line nearly as much as it is a group of people who care about the direction of the nation. 8.30, they pick a state. Sometimes they'll hear from a leader in that state, conditions in that state. And then at 9 o'clock, everyone is welcome to pray a prayer in agreement for spiritual awakening in America. 518-318-7117. Every Saturday night, Eastern Standard Time, 8.30 and then 9. Join me. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. By the turn of the century, the young nation was again in trouble. The seven Bible colleges had become very liberal, due in part to the influence of rationalism and the French Revolution. So the clergymen again called the nation to prayer. They began to create prayer packs and coalitions praying for the nation. John Jay, the Supreme Court Justice, declared the nation was gone too far. The church could not save us, but then God sent a second great awakening, the Cane Ridge Revival. As the 1800s progressed, the nation again fell into moral decline. The dividing moral issue was slavery, one sadly the church had failed to address. In the mid-1840s, major denominations divided North and South over the slavery issue, defending it or denouncing it. And the failure of the church to be the conscience of the nation, indeed, the moral compass for the nation. The preference for division, the split between whole denominations, North and South, Rather than choosing repentance from obvious sin, that church division was visited on the nation in a terrible civil war. And yet, on the brink of the nation's bloody civil war, God gave the nation mercy drops. A free black church in Charleston, South Carolina, broke out in revival, the Anson Street Church Revival. Charleston was called by the great evangelist George Whitfield to be the place of his greatest opposition, but also of his greatest success. John and Charles Wesley, too, were compelled to proclaim the Lord in the heart of this city at St. Philip's. Jeremiah Lamphere traveled from New York to Charleston to witness that revival, and he returned to New York with a yearning for revival in his own heart. Hi, 
My name is Terry Takel, and I want to tell you a true story. It happened in 1857 in the city of New York, actually in Manhattan on Fulton Street. New York was going through a very difficult time, 30% unemployment, all sorts of uh, problems in the city. But there was a man named Jeremiah Lampure. He was a tailor by trade, but he also was a caretaker of an empty church. The church had moved out to the suburbs and they asked him to watch the building. One day sitting on a park bench just like this, he watched the people passing by, depressed looking, kind of shuffling along, bent over, hopelessness in their eyes. He thought, you know, we need to pray. So he scheduled a prayer meeting on September 23rd at noon. Optimistically, he printed 20,000 handbills. I don't know how the man passed them out. But anyway, September 23rd came, 12 o'clock. <laughs> nobody came. <laughs> 15 after 12, nobody. At 12.30, six men walked in and they prayed. Well, the next time there was 20, then 30. And within three months, the church was full of people. So much so they had to go across the street to the YMCA. Almost every church in New York City had a noontime prayer meeting. The format was simple. They would come in at noon, have a scripture, sing a hymn, and then they would say, who here has a prayer? And somebody would lift their hand, my husband needs a job, my son's a drunk. And then they would pray for that person. What happened was that the prayers got answered. People brought their friends, prayers got answered. And a revival broke out where some, some estimate a million people came to Christ. It spread to Boston, it spread to Philadelphia. It was a wonderful story, and it's a true story. So I thought, why not redig that well, that well of revival? So my purpose today is to ask you if you would join us in praying for America. I think all of us know America's in trouble, and America needs a prayer, the perfect prayer, the Lord's Prayer that his kingdom might come, his will would be done, that daily bread would be provided, forgiveness would flow in this land, especially in Washington. So I'm asking you if you would just take a moment, set your phone to go off, and at noon, say the Lord's Prayer. And listen, the main reason we did it at noon is because the sun is the brightest at 12 o'clock. And we want the Son of God to be the brightest. We want Jesus to shine in your life, in your family, in your church, in your state, and in our nation. And if we pray that prayer, we can redig that well. And what happened in New York can happen right where you live. At the turn of the century, the overflow of the Wales Revival touched off a revival at Azusa Street in Los Angeles that circled the earth. And in the 1970s, the Jesus Movement changed and impacted the dropout, turn-on hippie generation. Every 60 to 70 years, God has graciously given us a spiritual wake-up call. We desperately need one now. Was, um, that was my friend Terry Teichel, who is a wonderful author. He's also does schools of prayer, and uh, he's a he's a he's a he's a Methodist. And uh, uh, Namsu uh, Choi, who we partner with, is Presbyterian. Is Presbyterian, and uh, Aaron Park, who serves as the national uh, uh, international leader for the World School of Prayer in 104 nations. He is Southern Baptist, and, uh, <laughs> and let's see, uh, you know, just we just write her that this is not unique. All of us feel a sense of holy desperation. Yes, we do to see a great uh, uh, awakening. So, among all the things that we do, all these prayer projects that we're involved in, and all the prayer resources we're creating, and the schools of prayer, and the attempt to raise up 
Project Prey University and also create uh, a coaching certification process for people who want to help churches, all that. One thing, two, two words, great awakening. Great, great awakening. Great awakening. How do you see again a great spiritual awakening? So your gifts, and again, this is the end of the year, Boy, what they mean to us to keep us us uh, going. Uh, 50 to 60% of our income is from small donor, dollar donor partners uh, who give in the range of 25 to 50, 60 dollars uh, uh, a month. And we are so grateful. And we need a thousand next year that haven't been giving in previous years to help us with these extraordinary projects. Just the Korean prayer project alone will run $1.5 million. <laughs> and uh, uh, we haven't even started calculating what we need for the uh, buses when they come in. We need about 10, I think eight or 10 charter buses just to get them around when they when they get in. Maybe you want to donate one of, the, one of those. But again, your your gifts mean so much. We don't talk about this very much. And you've got you've got some letters. I have a few notes here uh, from people, but I just wanted to go over some of the things that, for instance, Doug says small donor dollars. Well, it's kind of all over the board. For instance, this individual gave a $300 gift. This person gave a $5 gift. Now we're at 50. Now we're at 25. We're at 50. Now, this was in the last two weeks. 50, 100, and here's one for 1,000. So, wonderful. Thank you so very, very much. And here's one for 50 that we haven't heard from for a long time. And then we have one for 25. And then we have another one for 50. But I have to tell you a story. We had a lady that called and she said she heard Doug at a conference that we were at in North Carolina, in Fayetteville, North Carolina, I'm thinking. And uh, she called in and she said, how can I give cash money to you? <laughs> and I thought, can you not write a check? She said, no, I don't have a checking account. I said, can you not send it in a money order? And she said, well, I think that's the way I can do it, but I need to do it at a Walmart and you need to pick it up at a Walmart. <laughs> we have never done this before in this. our lives. I, I thought, this. okay. And uh, so she began to tell her story about how she heard, and I won't go through all of that, but then she, we worked it out. I went and picked up the thousand dollars. It was a money order. And it was that was a sacrificial gift. It right? was a sacrificial gift because this is a single mother. Yeah. And I'm I, going to I mean, cry. I remember feeling guilty about this. <laughs> it's a single mother who has a sick child to boot, who has a um, a feeding uh, disposition where she has to eat certain foods or she can't eat. And and both Doug and I felt we really did feel bad yeah. about it. Keep, keep your money. And we think, no, and yeah. She said, and she said, no, I can't do She that. said, God told me. I I woke up in the night and God told me that I need to send this thousand dollars to Doug Small, a live ministries, who is a prayer person, and I need to send this. So that happened about three years ago. Yeah. She has been giving, oh, every once in a while, it's $1,000, $1,000. And, and then she moved up north with her parents, and she sent $1,000 from up there. And I think it was maybe three, four, maybe $5,000 she sent. Today, I got this letter from her. Dear Brother Doug and Miss Barbara, Please accept this check on my behalf of the prayer center. <laughs> Newly formed 501c3 in Lumberton, North Carolina. I know it's not much, but I would like to start off this ministry by sowing into your ministry as I have done in the past. 
This plan is to open an interdenominational prayer and worship center for the region, working up to 24 hours a day. I understand that this is a big endeavor, but God is more than able. This is to bring him glory and unite people across denominations in the process. Please keep me in your prayers as I am literally walking on water by faith and the word that God has given me to do this for him. I don't know how he's going to do it, but I just know that he will. He's told me to do what I can and he will do the rest. And that's precisely what I'm doing to God be the glory forever. I love you with much love. And she signs it. Now, folks, I'm getting chills. <laughs> that woman was a single woman with a sick child who sacrificially gave over, I'm thinking, $5,000 over a period of five years. And now she's starting a prayer center in Lumberton, North Carolina. I'm so excited about what God is doing. You talk about a great awakening. God is moving. And it happens one person at a time. You may have disqualified yourself and said, I can't, I can't do it. Three things are always bound together. Prayer, fasting, and giving. Prayer is my relationship to God. Fasting is my relationship to my flesh dominated self. And giving is my relationship to the world. If you can't give it away, you don't own it. It owns you. And in that spirit of connecting with God, and letting his presence permeate our own life. And out of the overflow of that, giving God's grace and life to other people, that really is what, what, it's, what it's all about. So I don't, I, I don't want to not take this opportunity to, to tell you, thank you. We're so grateful Amen. for what you do, not only for your financial help, but for your prayers. We, we appreciate it. We thank you. And we pray as you face this new year, a special blessing upon you and that God will guide you and direct you in terms, just like her, of realizing you p- perhaps could do more than you ever thought you could do. A prayer center for the region. Wow. Who knows what God might be calling you to do for your city, Amen. for your region that would move along the process of great, of great awakening. And so may God bless you and be with you. By yes. the way, next week we have a special Christmas message. You don't, you don't want to miss it. And then we have one more program and then we jump into the new year. May God be with you. God bless you. Happy holidays. I love you, all of you. Bye-bye.